Despite all the trials and all the storms of this week or of our lives, God, I pray that we still trust in you and know that your plans are perfect, even though we may not see it and we don't know what lies ahead. But God, we trust that your power is at work even when we don't see it or feel it. And we pray that our hearts be open here this afternoon to to hear of your word and your goodness because there is no one like you and that we live each day for your glory. You deserve all our praises. We thank you, God. We pray all this in Jesus Christ's most precious name. Amen.
for you are our living hope, you are our hope, that you died on the cross for our sins, Lord, and that you defeated the grave and you rose again on the third day. And we thank you for your love, your love for us so much that we can't even comprehend. And God, I pray that, yeah, you be with us throughout the service and that your presence be here amongst us. We thank you, God, pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated.
welcome. Um, yeah, so really good to see you all and worship with you all again. Um, we always start with celebrations. So um, for our celebrations, we like to always um, welcome any new visitors. Um, so any new visitors amongst us, um, I think we have a new friend here. Welcome. Um, so can you what's your name? Brendan, nice to meet you. Welcome, Brendan. Anyone else that we have that is new today? Welcome. <laughs> What's your name? Daniel. Nice to meet you, Daniel. Welcome. Should we give a warm night? All right. Anyone else I missed? Any birthdays? We kind of, we didn't really have a proper English service. Yeah, so last week, Rowan, was that your birthday? Yay! Any other birthdays? I'm sure there were others as well. Leo? When's your birthday, Leo? Thursday, 4th. Oh, fourth. That was Thursday as well. <laughs> happy birthday. Congratulations, happy birthday. Anyone else? No? All right. Any other celebrations? Anything? Good. All right. That's good. Um, next, we have some announcements. Um, so uh, thank you, high schoolers, for kitchen duty today. Um, yeah, so thank you for washing our cups. Um, next, um, the deacon election. So we've talked about this a few weeks, um, and now the elections, um, the voting has closed. Um, and I think um, Ben, Uncle Ben, who we met a few weeks ago, he has been elected as deacon. So, yeah, he's not here, but we can applaud him. Um, and, yeah, we'll just keep praying for him and the other deacons to continue to serve um, in God's will. Um, next is just, um, yeah, just a reminder for you guys to keep in your prayers. Um, the Vanuatu mission trip, which we've also talked about a few weeks now, they are going next week. So, yeah, keep them in your prayers. Hopefully they can, yeah, just be safe and sound as they go and as they serve there. Um, next is um, our new series, um, and that's starting next week. Um, and that's on Ezra and Nehemiah. So, yeah, be here next week. Um, and the sermons um, are always online if you'd like to um, revisit them. Um, and yeah, as we kind of start a new sermon series, it's just a reminder that we have a daily Bible reading plan. Um, really useful for um, if you don't read the Bible regularly, this is a really easy way to start. So um, yeah, sign up to this and you'll get them in emails in your account. And so next is our New City Catechism question. So this week we'll do question 42, um, which is, how is the Word of God to be read and heard? The Bible is not just another book, and so we ought to approach it in a unique way. The, the Bible is God breathed, that's what this passage from 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is breathed out by God, it's inspired. Now, that doesn't mean that the Bible is inspiring. Now, it is inspiring, but whether anyone in the world is inspired by the Bible, the Bible is still inspired itself. It's, it's God's word to us, it's God exhaling, God opening his most hallowed lips and speaking to us. So this word is God wor God's word, and this word is exactly what God wanted to be written down in Holy Scripture. So that means we ought to approach this with a special reverence and with a special care. So we come to the Bible very carefully. We want to be diligent. We want to be prepared. We want to take it seriously. And we also come with, with a special reverence to this book because God is speaking to us. 
There's a submission to the word that one of the ways that, to think of the Christian faith is that we stop telling God what to do and God now speaks to us. I think a uh, theologian once said that, you know, to be a Christian meant you put your hand over your mouth and we're silent. And it doesn't mean that we can't ever cry out to God. Certainly the Psalms are full of that, but it means that we approach scripture with this reverence, wanting to hear from God, submitting ourselves fully to the word of God. And I like what, what it says here that when we come to it, the aim is not just information. It, it, it's never less than information. We're not against information. God uses that, but it's more than just information we're trying to get from the Bible. Uh, we want faith. That's what God wants, to accept this with faith so that there's a real delight in the word. There's a desire for it. There's a dependence upon it. We're embracing it with faith and then storing it up. So I love the line about John Bunyan that said, if you would prick him, his blood would be bibline. He was so full of the scriptures that it came out of him. That, that's what we want, that we store it up and then we practice it. Because after all, Jesus said, if you love me, what? If you love me, you will have a tingling sensation in your heart. No, he didn't say that. Those, that's wonderful. But he said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. So if we are serious about loving God, we must be very serious about obeying God and obeying his word to us. That's the aim, to be transformed by it, to embrace it in faith, to worship at his feet. Really, in its simplest form, we ought to come to the word of God with the same sort of attitude with which we'd come to God himself. So if God was speaking to you, which he does in the scriptures, if God was opening his mouth to us, how would we approach him? Well, I think we would listen very carefully. We would listen very diligently. We would listen very submissively. We would listen expectantly. And we'd listen with an aim to love and obey. So just a really good reminder, and I think an opportunity to afflict reflect on the attitude with which we read the Bible as well. Yeah, and with that, we go into the Bible verse of the month, I think. Oh, well, this is it, yeah. You'll find out next week's question next week. Um, so the Bible verse of the month. Um, let's read this together. Three, two, one, go. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. He is good. His love towards Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. That's Ezra chapter 3 verse 11. And um, as we talked about, we are signing Ezra next week. So I guess there's a little bit of a, a teaser. Um, and this is when um, the Israelites kind of came back to build um, the foundation for his temple after it was laid in ruins. So yeah, let's hear more about it next week. Um, so next is a time for prayer. Um, I just thought, I know, I'm kind of random different things up there, but um, it is stuff that's been happening around. I thought it's a good opportunity to pray about it. Um, as most of you would have heard this week, there was that big earthquake in Taiwan and still lots of people trapped. Um, all these families have uh, homes that we can pray for. Um, there's been the ongoing conflicts in Gaza, Israel, Ukraine and Russia that we can pray for. There's still lots going around the world that obviously I've not put up there um, that we can pray for. Um, and as we kind of heard about the, the trip to Vanuatu, that, um, you know, Ella, who's in our congregation here, she's going with her family and a lot of other people. So I think about 40, 41 people in their group. So massive group. Um, so yeah, pray for them. Uh, so yeah, so you might want to pick one of those things, whatever you want to do. You could turn to the person next to you if you like. Um, and just we'll all have a few minutes to pray by yourselves and, and then we can pray together.
And if you're still praying, you can keep praying. Um, but I'll just pray for us all together. Father God, um, yeah, we just really want to use this chance to pray for um, just people around the world, God. Um, we just want to think beyond ourselves, God, and just um, take this time to remember the people who um, are undergoing a lot of suffering right now. Um, God, we know that um, in you we can have hope and that we can trust in you. Um, we know that this world is, is, is not it. Um, that we have the hope um, of a world that is better to come. But God, um, yeah, people are, are suffering right now, God. Um, so I just really pray um, just for the people around the world who, who are suffering because they've lost their families or lost their homes or who don't have just the basic needs of life, God. Um, I just pray, Father, that you are just have mercy on them, God, that you would just show your compassion towards them. I pray just for peace, for comfort. Um, I pray that you would provide, that you would heal. Um, I pray, Father, that more of these people can come to know you, God, so that they can just be able to know a God that they can trust because you are a God that is in control. And and that they can have hope through you, hope that, yeah, that you can restore them, if not now in the world to come, God. Um, I just, yeah, I just really pray for these people, and I pray, you yeah, just offer all these prayers to you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I forgot to pray about the Maniwato trip, but I hope you have. <laughs> and keep praying for it over the week. Um, next um, is... I'm just going to read out the Bible passage um, that Pastor Sam's going to preach to us. Um, so this is in 1 Peter chapter 1. So 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was come to you, sorry, that was to come to you, searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. This is the word of God. Wow, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks, man. Having my back. Good afternoon. It's really good to uh, be here. I know this is a bit of a one-off random sermon for you guys from 1 Peter, but it is connected in the sense that 
Um, you're going to be thinking and looking about being the people of God united together to serve. And hopefully this is just a reminder about what a privilege it is to be part of God's people, all that you have to look forward to. And so you'll be able to come together united uh, to serve. And also, how great that I get to preach after that little clip about how important God's word is and how life-giving and how from, from God. And so let's just pray as we come to his word. Uh, Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you uh, so much for your word that is living uh, and active and speaks into our life even today, that corrects us and guides us and encourages us. us. So please, Lord, help me and each person here to listen carefully, to submit to all that you say, uh, and to know the power of your Holy Spirit working in us, that we may love you more, love one another, and be obedient to you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, there's nothing uh, quite like home. I remember when I did one of my three-night Duke of Edinburgh tramps, my favorite thing about that whole experience was when I got home and I took a 20-minute shower and, you know, washed four days of, like, sweat and dirt off me, then got into my own bed, clean sheets, and just fell asleep. It felt like heaven. It made, like, walking for four days, almost worth it for that oh, glorious moment of being clean. Since then, I've not done another overnight walk anywhere, but I'd almost do it just to recapture that feeling. Uh, we look forward to our home, particularly if we've traveled a little bit rough and ready, because home is a place where we are comfortable and safe. Home is a place where you relax and belong, where everything familiar and enjoyable is there for you. Limitless Wi-Fi. Home is somewhere that you miss and you long to return to. I'm not sure where you feel uh, most at home. Uh, perhaps in New Zealand, uh, perhaps in another country that you've lived for a while. But we miss what is familiar and at home. And <coughs> The book of 1 Peter and our uh, chapter today reminds us of where our true home is and where we'll feel most comfortable, what we are looking forward to, and how we can head home, the best place for us. <coughs> uh, the best place for us, Paul is saying, is offered to us in our future, when we get to go be with the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but Peter here, he wants to address our future home, but he wants to help us as we live here now. He wants to encourage us as we live here now, as homeward-bound Christians, sometimes uncomfortable, but having this glorious future that we head to. And so as we look at uh, 1 Peter 1 verse 12, keep your Bibles open there, because we're going to receive help from this word breathed out by God. First Peter is going to remind us uh, who we are, our Christian identity. Second, he's going to remind us what our future has in store for us at home. And then lastly, he's going to talk about our Christian privilege. So first, the Christian identity, verses 1 to 3. Just look with me there. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, one Peter calls Christians here, gives you a name, gives you a label, gives you an identity, elect exiles in the dispersion. The word dispersion there means scattered, and so Paul is writing to Christians who have been scattered around the Roman Empire. They perhaps, many feel alone and isolated, not at home. They were being persecuted both uh, physically and socially by uh, non-Christians, by the Roman Empire. Uh, Everyone uh, thought they were a weird cult. Uh, the world they were living in was hostile to them, and so they, they really weren't at home. It wasn't comfortable for them. They didn't belong. Uh, they weren't like everybody else. And the, uh, uh, that's the idea behind the word uh, exile there. Exiles, that is, can be translated often as strangers in, instead. The idea is that you're a foreigner, and you don't quite belong where you're living. You are away from home. And they were exiles because they were Christians. And so Peter is writing to these persecuted, exiled Christians, not at home. And still now, as Christians, we can say we are exiles. If you're a Christian, there'll be times when you feel like you don't belong. That this world, whatever country you feel comfortable in, isn't home. And those feelings and those experiences as difficult as they may, may be sometimes, are actually good and right, even though they're not easy. 
we are strangers and exiles. Our identity uh, is that we are on our way home and currently in a foreign land. And that is hard. Uh, I think particularly the younger you are, because when you're younger, you're kind of still figuring out where you belong in life and what you will be. And so I wonder where you get your sense of identity and purpose, your sense of belonging, your confidence, uh, what makes you who you are. For most, uh, you feel like uh, you belong and have a sense of identity based maybe on what your friends think or how many you have. Uh, So if they're like you, if you have lots of them, you feel comfortable and safe at home. Perhaps as you get older, you grow out of that. You kind of get get your friends. But now what the opposite sex thinks of you is really, really important. Uh, Can you get a relationship with someone? Am I good enough looking to date this person? Will they stay with me? And if they aren't, or if you're not dating, you can feel alone and isolated and, and worthless. There's a sense in which who you are will be tied up with a romantic relationship. Uh, For some, uh, university grades can be such an important part of your life that it's kind of who you are. If you can get that university degree, you'll feel successful, like you're doing well, and then you'll be looking forward to a future uh, where you can provide, get a good job, and that's a kind of a sense of who you are. And I say these things kind of not to be down on you, but just to help you think about what is the best place for you to place your identity and worth. Uh, Because it's not easy uh, being young. You're kind of figuring out in a myriad of ways uh, who you are going to be. And so if you think of your parents, all of them are now, or most of them will be husbands or wives, fathers or mothers. They already have a career that they've been going through for many years. They might own a home. They've settled down. Uh, Who they are is kind of together. And so they don't have to worry about other identity issues. Many of you still have to work through all those things. You don't know what you want to do or who you want to marry or where you'll live or uh, if you'll be fathers and mothers. So these younger years, they're a time of lots of growth and learning and direction setting. And in that time of figuring out who you are, sometimes being a Christian can throw something else in the mix. As a Christian you're different. And lots of thing, people think Christianity is weird or wrong. Some of your friends may be. So if you're really holding on to friendship as identity, then oh, you're going to feel that tension a lot more than someone who's kind of settled in with family. If a romantic relationship is really important to you, uh, you'll come across a non-Christian. You'll think, I really want to go out with them, but there'll be this tug of your Christian identity. And so you're really wrestling. So feeling like an exile can just carry a whole lot of extra weight. Uh, It can be a lot more difficult than when you get older. Um, You can be more isolated and alone uh, and wonder, is faith really worth it? I feel like a stranger in so many ways. Should I be a stranger as a Christian as well? And Peter's reply to that, should you be a stranger, should you be in exile as a Christian, is yes. Yes, you should, because you are not just an exile. That is your, not the only way you should think of yourself, but you are also elect. You are an elect exile. So on one hand, Christian identity is exiles, but on the other, it is being elect or chosen by God. We don't use the word elect that much anymore, but you might have at your studies elective courses at the university, your favorite course because you got to pick it, and it's easy because you picked the easy one. Well, Christians have been specially selected by God. Verse 2 says, uh, look with me there, according, uh, elect according to his foreknowledge, so before the foundation of the world, to be sanctified by the Spirit, that is to be set apart, sanctified as holy and different, for obedience to Jesus and forgiveness by his blood. Wonderful forgiveness for us and a new life to be lived for him. So we have the whole Trinity working together in you and for you. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit working together to elect you, choose you, save you, love you, uh, be with you. And that's pretty amazing. That is something worth building your identity around, that God looked upon you and God loves you. Imagine if you were at uh, 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 doing a youth group game 
and you had, it was a cooking game. You had $30, it was a challenge, $30 down to the supermarket and put together a dinner. And so your team goes down there, goes to the supermarket, and of all the thousands of items that are in the shopping aisle, you choose just a few, you put them in, their tr in your trolley. Now those items in the trolley, they may seem insignificant. If you just put them back on the shelf, no one would know any different, but they're important to you. You have specially chosen them for a purpose, and that's God. That is Christians. Of all the people in the world, God wants you. God loves you. You are special, chosen by God, that he may use you. And so I do encourage you, if you are here and you aren't a Christian, that God may have brought you to this church because he has chosen and loves you and wants to show you that love. So be open to God calling out to you at church so you can build your life and your whole identity on a God who loves you. Uh, Peter, in these opening verses, has presented to us a Christian identity. Christians are elect exiles. And there's a real tension there, isn't there? Elect meaning kind of chosen and special, but exile, exiles meaning uh, not at home, potentially facing uh, suffering and difficulty. And Peter addresses that tension kind of in the rest of the book, but here he says, you are elect exiles. What a blessing. A friend of mine was asked by a teacher at primary school, if you could be anyone in the world, who would you want to be? And he replied, innocent young answer, myself. Uh, and I thought that was a really cool answer because he was sure of who he was. He was comfortable with who he was. And if Peter had asked, who do you want to be? Who does he want to be? He would have said, above everything, I want to be an elect exile of God. And this message is good news to Christians scattered around the empire, feeling alone, perhaps good news to you if you're struggling in your faith, feeling alone. You are not just an exile, but you are precious in the sight of God. So I want you to know the encouragement of being an elect exile. And that's the first way uh, Peter helps homeward bound Christians, uh, by showing us our identity, who we are. But next he helps homeward bound Christians, he reminds us of our wonderful future as Christians. This Christian identity comes with an awesome new life, uh, hope, uh, uh, privilege. And we see that in verse uh, 3 to 12. Let me just read a few verses there. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Christians have been born again there. It says given this new life and a hopeful future. And the idea of hope, uh, if you have hope, it means that you anticipate with certainty a better, brighter future. And hope is really an important thing uh, in life. Uh, we have a really high rate of depression and suicide in New Zealand. And one of the things that makes depression uh, horrible to deal with is that it feels like there's nothing in your future that you have to look forward to. You just wake up and think, there's nothing good on my uh, horizon. There's nothing worth uh, living for. It's not going to get any better. And that's a really hard place to be, uh, a really hard illness of depression to fight. Uh, but the Christian identity and life offers hope doesn't completely uh, do away or fix all depression, but it offers a living hope and a better, brighter future because we trust Jesus and that he was raised from the dead and that we will have life and life eternal with him. Uh, we talked about not just life like life like we have now, that's hard as exiles, but he talks about a living, wonderful hope with an inheritance, he says, uh, Peter here is saying that we're born as rich kids. It says you have, verse uh, 4, you have been born to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. And we all have, or maybe you have, uh, friends whose parents are loaded. Life just seems easy for them, fun for them. They don't have to worry about money, food, clothes, house. They don't have to do like chores to get pocket money. I had a friend, and every time we went there, this is like ages ago, it's like 20 years ago, he got $20 a week pocket money, which would be pretty good like now even when you're like 13, 14. 
but this is um, quite old, so this is a long time ago. And his parents bought him anything anyway, so we'd rock up there, and he'd be like, oh, I haven't had my pocket money in like five weeks. So we're just walking around with a clean hundred dollars, going to the dairy, spending it up, and I was like, oh, I love having a rich friend. Um, <laughs> Peter says, hey, you have an inheritance. You are loaded. Wait until you enter your living hope. Wait till you're born again like Jesus is and you go to receive that inheritance from your father. It's going to be wonderful. You have a very bright future. And I want you to notice just how um, Peter talks about salvation. His way of speaking about it is actually quite unique. I don't know, you've done 1 Corinthians A with Paul. He, Paul talks about salvation as like justified now everything's here now, whereas Peter, he talks about some salvation as something to be revealed. We experience it now, he says, in joy, but there's actually more to come. So verse 4, our inheritance is kept in heaven for us when we get there. Uh, verse 5, our salvation is ready to be revealed in the future. And then verse 9 says, we are still to obtain the outcome of our faith. So the idea is that salvation is only going to get better for us. There's more for us. We are saved now. God will keep us, but our salvation will be complete when Jesus returns. And so Christians are and can always be hopeful of a better future, a more glorious future. And that's really important, uh, particularly because, once again, we're called exiles who will suffer uh, and struggle because we're Christians. And Paul addresses that um, in verse 6 and 7, uh, that the suffering produces uh, uh, a strong faith. And so for now, we may go through trials of various kinds, but we have that future. And the good thing about those trials is that it strengthens the faith that guarantees our future. So if you really want that glorious future, uh, spoken about that inheritance, and faith in Jesus is the thing that gets you that future, then you really want a strong faith. You want that faith tested to make sure it is true and pure and will last. And so suffering, though is hard, suffering as an exile, we know that that suffering is strengthening our faith, guaranteeing more and more each and every day our future. So if you feel like an exile, uh, more like an exile than an elect Christian, then know your faith is being strengthened. And this future hope, uh, can get you through suffering and hardship. It's like the end of university term. You're a bit tired of studying. Exams are there in the future, but then just after that is holidays and rest and a break and gaming and friends and the anticipation of that end of those holidays can help you get through that final week of uni. Our future hope does that. The fact that we're elect and heading towards a glorious future Helps us live now as elect, as exiles in this world. And then Peter uh, ends by showing us what a privilege it is to be a Christian. So we have this identity. We have this glorious future. And then I keep saying Paul maybe, but Peter says, man, wow, you are so pr privileged to have this future. He says there of the prophets, and just briefly that that uh, in the Old Testament, all these people who spoke on behalf of God, they were looking for Jesus. They were inquiring about when he was going to come and trying to figure out when he would bring this wonderful salvation they anticipated, but they didn't get to see him. And all their prophecies, all their anticipation was for our sake. They were showing us who Jesus truly was and why he came. Now, so prophets, they look to try and see what we get to enjoy now. And so do the angels there at the end of verse 12. They long to look uh, because fallen angels, they disobeyed God, but they were never offered salvation like us. And so the angels look at us and think, wow, you guys are privileged. You sin all the time, and yet despite that, you've been elect and loved by God for this glorious future. You are rich kids. You have so much to enjoy in the present. You have so much blessing coming for you in the future. And that's the point Peter makes uh, at the beginning of this letter. He says, Christians, you are elect exiles. I know it's hard, but you have this glorious future. You're privileged. And so I want to encourage you, uh, because sometimes the Christian life uh, can be difficult. 
I think over the last 10, 15 years, being a Christian and holding to some of uh, Christian beliefs have be- has become more difficult, uh, more unwanted. But I want to encourage you, you are chosen and precious to God. Remember, you are exiles here. You will be strange or a stranger. Uh, that uh, This place where we live isn't home. But remember, you are elect. You are loved and cherished by God. You do have a glorious future that will, you will enter into. So be encouraged as you head home. And if you aren't a Christian, I hope you'll see that the life and the future offered to those who believe in Jesus is filled with hope and filled with deep love from the God of this universe. So do consider uh, following him as someone who is an elect exile with a wonderful future. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, encouragement from your word. Uh, Sometimes we do struggle and know suffering, uh, hardship. Uh, Sometimes we feel left out or strange because of our faith, our commitments in this life. I pray you would impress upon each one of us uh, your love and heart and care for us. I pray you would enable us to lift our eyes above uh, some of the the challenges of this life to our glorious future. And I pray you would make known to each one of us how privileged uh, we are to have your love be over us, to have an inheritance uh, kept for us, and that even as we go through suffering and struggle, all that is for our good and to secure that future. So please do encourage us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, let's stand and sing a song in response. Let's sing of this living hope, the hope that is beyond what we can see and is eternity with Christ. Jesus Christ, my living hope. 
Father, we thank you. We thank you that we gather not as foolish people, but we gather as people who believe in a risen King, our Lord Jesus, who is our living hope, as, as clear as the tomb is empty. We know that our future is brighter, more glorious. We are rich kids waiting for our inheritance from heaven. So we thank you, Lord, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take a seat, brothers and sisters. It's lovely to be with you again. And uh, yeah, I really miss English service last week, so it's lovely to see everyone. Uh, we are moving into a time uh, called the Lord's Supper. And so uh, this may be old news for many of you, but uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, this is a time uh, once a month uh, at our church we will remember the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I was at a, a, a birthday party uh, last night. Uh, it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of kids in the house. Uh, it was full. It was free. I want you to imagine that uh, you go to a birthday party every year with your family. Um, and then, I don't know, you know, it's a family gathering, a couple of friends and family. Uh, there's this uncle who's really nice every year. And imagine that, you know, a couple of years later, this uncle just stands up in the middle of the party and says, you know this birthday that we've been celebrating? It's all about me. You'd be shocked, wouldn't you? Jesus does the same thing when he takes a traditional Jewish meal, the Passover meal. And with his disciples, who have met together, they've celebrated all the ups and downs of, of, of life together for three years. And then on the night before he was betrayed, he says, this meal is actually about me. Now, some of you will know that this uh, Passover meal celebrated elect exiles who were heading home. Right? This is a meal that was celebrated by the Jewish people when they uh, first were rescued from slavery, from, uh, from a foreign land, and they were led home. And, and to remember that, they were told by the Lord God to, to take this meal, this Passover meal, to remember uh, the rescue that they've had. And then, thousands of years later, Jesus says, this meal is pointing to me. This meal is pointing to the, the salvation I am giving you the living hope I will promise and I will fulfill for you. And so if this is a living hope that you believe in, if this is a living hope that you know and trust here today, then I welcome you to join this meal. If this is a living hope that you trust in and your baptism is a sign of faith in that hope, I welcome you to join this meal. No matter if you've been here for the first time, whether you've been here for year after year, um, we have our wonderful servers here to uh, pass out the elements. So uh, as we do each month, uh, I want to pray uh, and then invite you guys to just come up uh, in an orderly fashion uh, and to uh, grab uh, uh, both elements and we'll return to our seats and then we will uh, remember the, um, our Lord Jesus Christ together through the Lord's Supper. Let me pray. Father, we thank you that this Passover meal that we celebrate is a wonderful meal. It reminds us of a living hope that we share. Not just as individuals waiting for heaven, but as a family. Father, it is as if right now we are praying before a family banquet. It looks so trivial compared to the one we are looking forward to with the Lord Jesus. The fullness of that salvation being shown to us where we sit with him. In the meantime, we go through many trials, and yet we greatly rejoice because we know that there is a better future awaiting us as family in Christ. We thank you for that. And so help us to fix our eyes on Jesus as we remember the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. We thank you. We pray these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. Great. And maybe we can start on this side, and then um, feel free to just make it.
Let me read from the words of um, the Apostle Paul, who says this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. So do this in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters, um, let us remember the body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken for you. Continuing our reading. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim it, the Lord's death, until he comes. So, brothers and sisters, let us proclaim the body of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, poured out for you. Shall we pray together? Oh Lord, these elements seem so small and insignificant, so imperfect, so far from the reality of a meal with Jesus, full and rich, complete, a day we long for. We go through so many things right now. We, we have insults thrown at us. We have evil handed to us. We have suffering dealt to us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, that this is not our ultimate future. This is not our forever home. Thank you that you have chosen us in Christ. Thank you that we are elect exiles headed home. And in that home, as we walk in, Father, we thank you that there are many rooms. We thank you that this is a place where there is no more suffering and sin that clings so closely right now. There's no more death. Just the presence, the embrace, the joy of our Savior, Jesus the one who made this meal possible, the one who made our salvation possible. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Help us to live for him, to suffer for him, to continue walking by faith in his promises. Help us to uh, be humble with ourselves, that under your mighty hand, you would lift us up in the right time. And help us, Father, cast all our anxieties on you, Lord, because you care for us, just as we have this meal as a sign of your care, just as we have each other, brothers and sisters in the Lord, as evidence of your grace and kindness. We thank you, Lord. Continue to speak to us and be with us as we journey on home. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. In a moment, we're going to uh, end our formal time of worship, but worship continues, doesn't it? We live lives uh, heading home, and so we want to be continuing our worship everywhere we go. And so I don't want you to be disappointed that we, we, we disperse, because when we disperse, we are still united in Christ, uh, bought by the blood that He shed for us. And so let's remember that as we go into our groups, as we go into our family meals, and so on, as we go into the world uh, that uh, God has sent us out into. I want to just remind you that uh, we do take up a weekly offering. We don't pass the bags around, but we do give thanks uh, for every good gift that the Lord has given us. Um, if you do want to contribute regularly to the work of this church, uh, whether it is um, bringing in guest pastors uh, like Sam to uh, bring God's Word so faithfully, whether it's just to keep the lights on, uh, to get out uh, great coffee, uh, all of this uh, we, we, we fund and we give thanks for those who give regularly for this work. And we, we thank you too for those of you who, who don't give financially, but in lots of different ways, your time, your talents. We thank you for people at the back who are running sound and slides behind me who are uh, making sure we are worshiping in spirit and in truth and among us as you just use your gifts for God's glory. 
So why don't we pray for all these things? Let's give thanks for the gifts God has given us, uh, to us and for us. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you love cheerful givers, not reluctant or um, obligated givers. And Lord, you gave us so much. You show that to us on the cross. And Lord, we have all we need through you. And so, Lord, help us as a church to abound in every good work as we give generously, sacrificially uh, of our time and talent and treasures. May every gift we give actually remind us more and more this is not our final home. May we not cling to our resources and our time so tightly. Let us help uh, you uh, and each other here. Let us uh, make your kingdom known to more and more people who need a better home than the one they're in, who who need a better future than the one they are stuck in, in Christ. We ask for all these things. Amen. Let me leave us uh, with uh, a blessing from the Lord. Why don't we stand? And I want to invite you to receive these blessings uh, through faith in Christ. I'm reading this from 1 Peter in the end. Be self-controlled and alert because your enemy is prowling like a roaring lion. And yet the God of all grace has called you to his eternal glory. And so to him be the power forever and ever. And all of God's people here said, Amen. Let's do life together. Bless you all.